What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kafinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guest in this episode of Hidden Forces is Daniel Paris. Daniel is a senior portfolio manager at Federated Investors, where he oversees the firm's dividend-focused products. He's also the author of four books on investing, including his most recent, The Ownership Dividend, The Coming Paradigm Shift in the Stock Market. Daniel and I spend the first hour of our conversation discussing the relevant history that explains how the stock market went from a mostly cash-based system where all or almost all companies, if they weren't in distress, paid dividends and where those dividends were meaningful in size to a public investment landscape driven entirely or almost entirely by near-term share price movements. The second hour provides listeners with more actionable information about how to position oneself to profit from a paradigm shift in markets that Daniel argues is already underway. We discuss the pros and cons of dividend investing, how Daniel approaches portfolio construction when it comes to dividend yielding stocks, and how the changes that he is forecasting will alter the investment landscape and economic opportunities for businesses and workers alike. If you want access to that part of the conversation and you're not already subscribed to Hidden Forces, you can join our premium feed and listen to the second hour of today's episode by going to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe. All of our content tiers give you access to our premium feed, which you can listen to on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. If you want to join in on the conversation and become a member of the Hidden Forces Genius Community, which includes Q&A calls with guests, access to special research and analysis, in-person events, and dinners, you can also do that on our subscriber page. And if you still have questions, feel free to send an email to info at hiddenforces.io and I or someone from our team will get right back to you. Lastly, because this conversation deals with investing, nothing that we say on this podcast can or should be viewed as financial advice. All opinions expressed by me and my guests are solely our own opinions and should not be relied upon as the basis for financial decisions. And with that, please enjoy this invaluable and highly educational conversation with my guest, Daniel Paris. Daniel Paris, welcome back to Hidden Forces. Dimitri Kafinas, thank you so much for having me back. It's great having you on. It's been a while. You've been on the show twice before. And I've told you this, and I've told our audience this, that I've thought about this quite a bit. And I do think that you are the most underrated financial historian that I have ever read. And I've read a lot of people. And I think your book, Back to Business, which was the book that introduced us to each other, it was the book that brought you on my show back in 2018, I think it was when you first came on, is one of the best and most underrated I've ever read. And, and that episode is one of the best. And I highly recommend it to people. It's going to be in the related section to this week's episode page, as well as the last time you were on. But anyway, it's great stuff. And you've written a new book. The title of this book is The Ownership Dividend, The Coming Paradigm Shift in the U.S. Stock Market. Exceptional book. I was telling you this as well. And what I love about it also is that it's more accessible than your previous book. Not that your previous book wasn't accessible. It actually was. But this is actually much smaller even. And so it's one of the books that you could really – I literally read it in a day. And it's very concise and it's a great handbook and sort of like guidebook for people who want to understand not just dividend investing, but also how we got to where we are today in the stock market, the paradigm that we've existed in the last 40 years, and why you believe that we are about to enter a paradigm shift or that paradigm shift has already begun. Dimitri, thank you so much for all the kind words. And uh, yeah, the, the book from 2018 is kind of a, a bigger book, and this is maybe more digestible. Uh, some of that has to do with the publishers. One was a publisher, they preferred hardback and maybe bigger font, and, and the new publisher, this is uh, definitely a handier treatment, but if it makes it more digestible and easier to distribute, uh, then uh, I'm all in favor of that. So thank you once again for the support, and yes, the books are different, and this is meant for practitioners. The ownership dividend is designed really for financial advisors and, and to some extent, you know, do-it-yourself investors, analysts, gatekeepers, 
people just thinking about the capital markets, but also thinking about the broader systems that we, the hidden forces that operate the broader systems that we all live in. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very excited for this conversation. Before we get into it, let's do a, a quick background into you for people who don't know you, who you are, or who would like to hear a refresher. Because you're an interesting guy. I mean, I've told this story many times. I don't know if I ever told it on the show, but it's one of my favorite stories from uh, meeting a guest in person. You were coming to our New York studio, and I actually had to come get you from an Italian cafe down the street where you had stopped for a coffee because you were early. And I found you in the back playing chess, playing peer-to-peer remote chess on your phone. And you kind of lifted your finger up and you said, you know, you told me to kind of stop because you were in the middle of a move. You finished the move and then you got up and that's how we got introduced. So you're a big fan of chess and uh, you have a PhD in Soviet history and somehow you ended up in finance. So how did that all happen? Yeah, it's a story that you wouldn't generally want to reproduce. It's kind of interesting and difficult to go through. But yeah, I I do primarily identify as a historian. I do very much keep abreast of what's going on, sadly, as it were, involving the former Soviet Union. I've been uh, quite busy the last two years. I I was under contract for this latest book, Dmitry and I, Russia Invaded Ukraine. And a couple months later, I called up my publisher, the editor, and said, I'm going to be late. I'm not going to make deadline. And she said, why? And this is for a book about financial history. I said, well, Russia invaded Ukraine. And she, there was a pause on the other end. And she says, I don't get it. And I said, well, let me explain it to you. And so that sucked all the air out of the room for at least six months. But yeah, I, I started out as a historian of the former Soviet Union during the Reagan era Cold War in the 1980s. I went to graduate school, got a PhD in, modern, in what would then be called modern Russian history and taught for a few years. But Russia had collapsed. Convergence was underway. The West had won. Fukuyama was correct. The neoliberal paradigm had prevailed, so we thought. It was just a matter of time before Russia adopted Western norms and conventions. And as a consequence, a great deal of the Cold War infrastructure fell away in the 1990s. Much of the funding went away and moved towards Middle Eastern studies, Chinese studies, frankly, where where it probably belonged. And kind of reading the writing on the wall, even though I had a reasonably, an okay teaching position, I was okay with it, but I could read the writing on the walls and decided to move on and leave academia and go into business. Hint to everyone, being 33 years old and having never opened up an Excel spreadsheet, having knowing no accountancy at all, it's going to make things difficult if you're trying to go from the humanities into business. A suggestion You don't have to be an Excel wizard if you are an English major and thinking about going into business or even going into arts administration, but you do have to know how Excel works. And everyone should understand a little bit of accounting. It is the language of business. If you can speak tourist French or tourist Spanish, you should also know tourist accounting. Life will be easier for you. So a couple couple suggestions as you make the career transition. Mine was kind of gruesome. I had five years of a pretty difficult on the job MBA, a couple different businesses where I had to learn in the trenches. But I finally kind of made it and uh, joined my current employer, Federated Hermes in Pittsburgh, uh, in August of uh, 2002, and have uh, been there for coming up on 22 years. Yeah, actually, I should probably say this, right? I, just in full disclosure, I'm a very happy investor in your strategic value dividend fund at Federated Hermes. So not only are we friends, not only have you been on the show, but I'm actually... I have money with you. So this is a, truly a, quite an endorsement. <laughs> and full disclosure, then we're going to have to go through the disclosures and say that nothing here is construed as investment advice. Yes. And nothing here is a promotion of any specific products or performance claims. Uh, happy to discuss the book, but we'll leave the products to another day. Yeah, but also in fairness, I mean, weren't you, weren't you listed as uh, the Wall Street Journal's number one active manager in 2022? So the funny thing about being... A dividend investor in a stock market, which is how I characterize my day job, is that the US stock market has been on a tear for 15 years, really, with very low risk rates. And we'll get into the paradigm and so forth. But every once in a while, there's a hiccup. And when that hiccup happens, whether it was in 2015, 16, or 2022, or even 2001, 2002, 2008, uh, a being a dividend investor in a stock market on a uh, relative basis uh, looks pretty attractive. It's not really the purpose of being a dividend investor in a stock market. The purpose of being a dividend investor in the stock market is to deliver a high and rising income stream. But in terms of what the Wall Street Journal looks for and what other third party 
you know, gatekeepers and rankers look for, they could confuse me with being a clever stock picker every seven or eight years. Not really our uh, intention. Our intention is to, to deliver that income stream, but it, it plays out that way whenever there is a market hiccup. Yeah. You know, I think actually the second hour would be an opportunity where we can get into, I can even share a little bit about why why I like your fund and what, what, what role it plays in my own sort of uh, investment strategy. And uh, that kind of speaks to some of the stuff you've written about in the book, like Clarity, for example. And that actually, just to say this, and then I have one more question about your bio. That's something I really liked about this book that you didn't do in previous books. I felt that you you took a bigger risk in terms of being more direct with the reader in ways that you haven't in previous books in terms of what you believe. I mean, there was even an entire chapter dedicated to what you think is going to actually happen, You know what this new paradigm shift is going to look like, which again, I'm very excited to get into. One more question before we get into the book. You spent five years getting a PhD and then you basically just went into the private sector. What value did that PhD give you? What were you able to take from that experience and apply in the world that you work in today? Yeah, and I, I wish it were five years. It was eight. <laughs> I'm sorry to admit it. It was when I had to fill out my marriage license, you had to indicate every year spent in education. It became kind of embarrassing. You went down to City Hall to fill out a marriage license, and there was just too much there. It was embarrassing to my wife and myself. Eight years getting a PhD. Even though the PhD is in modern Russian history, and I work in finance, I will absolutely plant a flag in the ground, and I have in the past with others, and say, as a historian operating in a field, if you choose to know the history of that field, to really know the history of the field, it will make you a better practitioner in said field, whether that's a plumber and you learn the history of plumbing, whether it's brain surgery and you learn the history of brain surgery, whatever your endeavor is to learn, the, understand the history of that endeavor makes a huge difference. So the PhD is about Bolshevik political culture. That's not really particularly relevant for modern finance history and theory or practice. But the sensibility of being a historian, once I had settled into the new profession, so I arrived, Dimitri, and I very quickly memorized the rules of the new profession. That is, I, I took the CFA exam in three years and, and got that certificate. It was a kind of a brutal experience. It's by design. But once I was settled and credentialed in the new profession, my historical approach, meaning my tendency to ask, where did these rules come from and do they still apply? That's the, the important mm. point. History for history's sake, not as useful as, do they still apply? Do the circumstances under which they were created, do they still apply? Do the rules still make sense? And the book from 2018, which you've spoken of, laudatory, thank you very much, is about a modern portfolio theory that is, it was created at a certain point in time for a certain reason. 50, 60 years later, does that reason still apply? Some people might say yes. Some people might say no. I think it's useful to know the answer to that, to ask that question and then to answer that question. The same thing with the book that's come out now, and the same thing with being basically in my day job, a, a dividend investor in a stock market. I'm a dividend investor in a stock market because having observed both the present and the history of the capital markets, I am more comfortable with one of those than with the other. And the current book, The Ownership Dividend, is a, an exploration of the last 30 or 40 years, asking the question, where did this come from? Very unusual stock market characteristics, all buybacks, minimal dividends, dividend-free large stocks, et cetera, which we'll get into. Where did it all come from? The book answers that question and also raises the very important practitioner question. Are those reasons still valid? And if you're planning for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, do you want to assume the continuation of the paradigm that we saw from 1980 to 2020? Or is that paradigm likely to change? And, and that's really what the book is about. Yeah, just This is for me and for anyone who has, in particular, for anyone who, who has read your previous book or previous books. How does this book flow from that work, that body of work? And what was missing from those works that you feel this book adds to? Yeah, I think that I had a particular issue with the book in 2018, that is the modern portfolio theory really struck me as a really interesting 1950s and 60s solution to a 1920s and 30s problem. And that was the bee in my bonnet. And I, I dealt with that and pointed out that 50 or 60 years later, the physics envy of modern finance, modern finance comes into being in the mid 20th century, 
a lot of physics envy. It's called social science. Human beings are just physics atoms. Human beings operate according to these rules, et cetera. And modern finance reflects that. It's a very useful teaching, by the way, tool, all of MPT and the other elements and CAPM and so forth. But I just didn't feel they described the human condition very well. They certainly didn't describe business ownership as it's actually played out. And so, you know, that was a historical appreciation and critique of, of modern portfolio theory, which is the underlying a lot of the guidelines that we currently invest by. That was the point of that book. This book is more focused on investment practices as they currently are. This is the stock market that we all know and love and we all see all day long, really characterized for the last several decades. And I'll highlight it by declining interest rates, by the phenomenon, the almost trillion dollar phenomenon of buybacks, corporate buybacks, makes crazy buybacks, but they are what they are. The NASDAQ innovation engine, very, very impressive, nothing wrong with it, no criticism there. And the geopolitical paradigm of neoliberalism, which we've, we're discussing in the green room, providing a framework for the march of capital, created an almost perfect environment really for stock market returns. And and my question as a historian is, that's great. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with There's nothing illegal, immoral, unethical with the market, the way it's structured now. It is, however, even upon minimal review, absolutely the case that it's historically anomalous, Hmm. that you would have 40 years of declining interest rates, lowering risk rates, that you would have large successful businesses not making cash distributions to company owners that you would have as many dollars are spent on dividends, actually more, spent on buybacks speculating on company shares, and the other characteristics, the SPACs and so forth that we've seen, the evidence of exuberance that we see periodically. Now and again, different environments in the stock market that I thought from a historical perspective, if you look at capital markets either in the past, in theory, or at other capital markets, the US market the last 30 years is very unusual. And as a historian, I'm just pointing that out and suggesting where I think it's going to go. But even if people disagree with me as to where it might go, pointing out how unusual the last three decades have been from a historical perspective, I think has great utility. Hmm. So typically, the books that sell the best in this category are ones that offer actionable advice. And while you know you don't fall in that category exactly, this isn't like, you know, do X, Y, Z and you'll get rich tomorrow. This book is in some sense more actionable than previous books, though it's actionable in a kind of structural way. And as I said, you actually go to great lengths to to tell readers what it is that you actually think, you know, to forecast what you think is going to happen. Again, not you know detail for detail, in order to position themselves to profit from this paradigm shift in markets that you think is underway. How would you summarize what that paradigm shift is? And what is it that makes you feel so confident about your forecast? Yeah, let me introduce that answer by saying, you know, other types of similar forecasts. That is, when share buybacks were became practical without being charged with uh, market manipulation in 1982, someone could have forecast, hey, that's going to lead to a paradigm shift in regard to buybacks. And, and it did. It wasn't necessarily actionable the next day. but but it became very much actionable for decades afterwards. When Ogle introduced the index fund in the mid-70s, you know, did that immediately change lives? No. Did it change billions and trillions of dollars of asset allocation over subsequent decades? Absolutely. And so I'm not putting myself in that category, but I'm going to put myself in that category just for the sake of argument and say the structural shifts that I foresee coming in, and it's mostly really structural shifts that I see foregoing out. There's plenty of room for people to disagree as to what's going to replace the old paradigm, but I'm pretty confident the old paradigm is gone, that that is going to create the stage for individual investors, institutional investors, hedge funds, grandma, to have a different approach to investing in the years ahead. It may not have, you know, as we record this in early 2024, it may not have an impact on your portfolio in the next few weeks or months or even in 2024 at all, but it should have an impact on how you think about investing. And the number one practical implication of that, after years and years of declining interest rates, 40 years of declining interest rates, 1981, to 2020. And the interest rate I'm referring to is the one that really drives the stock markets, the 10-year. It's not necessarily the overnight rate or the Fed funds rate, but the 10-year. It's coming down for decades. The 10-year is used as a proxy for lots of things. 
It's used in a lot of different formulas. It's a proxy for inflation, for risk, for academic finance. It's a subject of supply and demand for actual treasuries, you know, 10-year, 10-year treasuries. But amongst all of those push and pull factors, it's a proxy for risk. And risk was coming down for decades and decades and decades. Interest rates coming down for decades and decades and decades. And as that happened, investors, institutional investors, hedge funds, corporate executives making capital allocation decisions got used to the fact that their cost of funding on the debt side or even on the equity side was going down. Each year, risk appeared to be a little bit lower, funding costs a little bit lower, the cash cost of equity lower and lower. And that trend, it is my belief, has come to an end. It ran for 40 years. There were good reasons. Remember, interest rates were abnormally high in 1981, late 70s, early 80s, before Paul Volcker took away the punch bowl. So they were abnormally high when they were in the mid-teens, but they got abnormally low, particularly after the financial crisis, 2008, 2009, you had the tenure at abnormally low rates for, I consider abnormally, just one man's opinion, for 15 years. And risk rates, risk rate is what I refer to as not the tenure, not the figure that you put into a capital asset pricing model or any other figure that you want as a discount rate, because those are really formulaic and driven by interest rates. But a risk rate is what keeps you up at night. It's the kind of in the gut, absolute discount rate that you use for any venture, public, private, personal, whatever the case may be. And these were coming down and down and down and down and down. And the kind of key argument in the book is that interest rates and risk rates have stopped going down. I don't know where they're going to end up. I don't know where the 10 year is going to end up. 3%, 4%, 5%, 6%. Yes. One of those numbers doesn't really matter to me. What I do know, it's not going to be zero anymore, risk mm. rates or even the 10 year. And what that means is the return of risk. And what that entails for asset allocation and for practitioners or for thing, anyone thinking about investment is that during that period of 40 years of declining risk rates, declining interest rates, declining cash rates of return, dividends disappeared from the US stock market, interest rates on fixed income securities and bonds got very close to zero, very, very low for a very long period of time. And then boom, the last couple of years, that model, which we'll get to, it's the reasons why it changed, but it changed. And now cash has a mid-single digit rate of return. Fixed income instruments have a mid-single digit cash rate of return. Government securities, the US stock market still does not. And the argument the, in that chapter, the going forward chapter in the book towards the end is that I believe the US stock market is going to see a return of the cash nexus. That's what I refer to, the absence of the cash nexus for decades and now the return of the cash nexus, where a minority owner, meaning a non-majority owner of a large successful business, would reasonably expect a share of the profits after all operating and investment expenses have been made. You would expect that from real estate, you would expect that from a rental property, you expect that from farmland, you would expect that from a private ownership. Dimitri, you would expect that from your brother-in-law's pizza shop, that after the first few years, the pizza shop works or it doesn't. If it works, you expect a check in the mail. Even for the most innovative companies, there comes a time when they either make it or they don't make it, and a minority owner of said company would expect a cash return. That's been the standard for 5,000 years of recorded asset history, plus or minus any given market other than purely speculative ones. It was not the standard for the last 30 years of the US market. So the return of the cash nexus is what I think investors should be preparing for. And you ask, what's the practical implication? Well, we just saw that a couple of days ago. One of the Magnificent Seven announced a dividend, minuscule dividend. And the dollar value of the dividend is one-tenth the amount that they announced on share buybacks waste of money. But it's still a dividend. Look for other of your favorite tech companies to announce dividends. And then you as an investor or practitioner or asset allocator or an analyst are going to be judging assets, not by as much just the attraction of the stock without any tether associated, but with the attraction of the asset and its income stream. It's just been anomalous and unusual to have a significant asset class with no income stream attached to it. That's coming back, the return of the cash nexus, and that will affect how people manage their portfolios going forward. 
Yeah, that was Meta, otherwise known as Facebook, that announced a dividend on Thursday, February 1st. And that's something I plan to ask you about. Before I do, I want you to put your forensic historian hat on for me here. And let's kind of delve into some of these relevant factors that you pin the paradigm that we've lived in on. Interest rates, share buybacks in Silicon Valley. Let's just focus on risk rates for a second here. What are the major forces driving the fall in risk rates over the last four decades? Yeah, and this is the fun part. The chapter, which is getting a lot of traction, is the political economy chapter. And the answer to your question is political economy. We had, if the United States had been kind of an isolated economy with its own interest rate structure, it may not matter, but part of a global system, starting in the late 70s, early 80s, globalization takes off with a vengeance. 1979, Deng Xiaoping comes to power in China, begins the process of opening it up. Margaret Thatcher in 1979 as well. Ronald Reagan in the United States in 1980. Interest rates peak in 1981. The SEC law about the safe harbor statement allowing buybacks, 1982. And you see a period of globalization, deregulation, the unfettered march of capital really around the globe. And suddenly the United States is able to you know, import cheap goods from China. We import deflation from China via Walmart for decades and decades and decades. And it works, it works just fine. Thank you very much. Another major industrial icon that might make aircraft, you know, shifted from making aircraft to assembling aircraft in that time period. And now that's come back to haunt them. But that was the model. Outsource higher profits. Buy back your shares, higher share price, executives get paid, deindustrialize, import everything from China just in time in a pallet, it'll get there. You don't need to have any inventory, therefore you don't need to have any working capital, and you trust the third party manufacturer to deliver the goods according to spec. That paradigm worked, worked for decades. And as part of it, as interest rates came down, the need to pay cash for an investment or for a company to pay a share of the profits just diminished because the hurdle rate, the cash hurdle rate got lower and lower and lower as profits moved up, interest rates moved down, the system seemed to be working, working just fine. Any excess cash could be used in buybacks, which just lubricated the system even further by pushing up EPS. So you had kind of a perfect storm for the neoliberal paradigm. Everything got outsourced. We deindustrialized. The stock market was very successful. The social costs only became evident towards the end of that period, the industrialization of the heartland, the troubles faced by the middle class. And now it's you know, manifested very clearly in the political radicalization that we're all facing in 2024. So the disappearance of dividends, the disappearance of the cash nexus did not occur in isolation. It's part and part of this overall system. And now that that system is on its way out, the global neoliberal paradigm is, is retreating rapidly as we speak, that it, clearly a new system is going to come into place and it's going to involve, I think, people being less inclined to take a minority stake in a business, public, private, whatever, and just count on the share price or the capital market, a harvested capital gain or a harvested capital loss, that investors are going to be less willing to accept that. Retirees and a lot of investors for the last couple of decades have funded their consumption with harvested capital gains. Nothing wrong with that. They had to use harvested capital gains because there was no income to be had the last 15 years or very, very little. We were one of the few vendors that provided still a kind of a reasonable income solution. And it worked for as long as it worked. And you know, there were plenty of journalists, as I made the rounds with the book Dimitri I was mentioning in the green room, that they said they have no beef with a harvested capital gain rather than a dividend payment. They don't really care. And they think the current system is going to continue on just fine. There's no reason for it to change. I respectfully disagree. One of the topics we can take up in greater detail, and hopefully it'll be something that your listeners will come to agree with once they think about it, is that a harvested capital gain and a dividend payment are not the same thing. They're not the equivalent that modern academic finance tells you they are. They're dramatically different. And so again, these are kind of philosophical differences as a historian approaching the market that I've come to conclusions. And they do suggest that the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years are going to be different in terms of the plumbing of the market than the last 15 or 20 years. That's a great explanation because you also brought up share buybacks. Another thing that you talk about in the book is Silicon Valley. And my question is like, would we be where we are today? Because 
again, like Deng Xiaoping, 1979, Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, 1980s. That was really the beginning of financialization. But it wasn't until the 90s where we saw a real decline in the issuance of dividends. And so like, would that have happened if we didn't have this go-go marketplace where there was this whole new paradigm of companies that were growing rapidly and whose share price was growing rapidly and providing opportunities to exit at very high multiples that put people's attention on the price of the stock rather than the income stream. You've stated the contrary view perfectly, and I just don't disagree with anything you've said there. That worked. It worked really, really well. To fund consumption, to not fund consumption, meaning reinvestment, just letting the capital grow, that worked really, really well. My point in the book is not to cast any shade on that at all. It's simply to point out that a lot of those companies now are very, very mature and they're very large. They've started buying back their shares. Remember, a growth company doesn't buy back its shares. It needs the money to reinvest. These companies now you know, finance uh, it's like $800 billion in share buybacks last year. I think it was a trillion dollars, close to a trillion dollars the year before. That they are now in a position to become normal companies again in regard to minority shareholders and provide a cash payment. They have succeeded and should be uh, applauded for having succeeded, changing the world. But at a certain point, they too become investable from a business owner's perspective, just because they've become so large. I make fun of a large online bookseller, item seller, and cloud service provider, whether it will ever get large enough. You know, We talk about companies need to invest to get scale before they can possibly pay a dividend. And I make fun of one of these companies Will it ever get large enough to pay a dividend? It apparently had a very good year in 2023, but up through 2022, it really couldn't afford to pay a dividend because free cash flow just isn't there to support a a material dividend. I haven't reviewed the 2023 numbers yet, but my joke is maybe one day that company, which we all know and love, will get larger. Right now, it's a, a behemoth. It's the largest retail company on the planet in the Western world, I think, and yet it still couldn't afford to pay a dividend. Well, that raises interesting questions. If a company gets mm. that large and can't afford to pay a dividend, hmm, to me as a business owner, particularly a minority share business owner, I got to ask, well, that's unusual. They've spent 30 years building that business up and it's one of the largest gargantuans on the planet and it's still not large enough to, to pay a dividend. Hmm, okay, well, I'm going to pass on that one. So that has some very important practical implications for investors, which I want to talk to you about. Before we talk about that, I have a question which has to do with comparing the growth stocks of the you know industrial period to the growth stocks of today. If I'm not mistaken, RCA, which would have been considered a kind of tech stock of its era of the 1920s, did not issue a dividend, right? In fact, that was the That was the stock that Groucho Marx complained about in your last book that you quoted him. The railroads did issue dividends. They were techs. They were, again, tech stocks of that time. And I think if you would ask someone in 1920 why a company goes public, they were bound to give you a very different answer than people give you today, I imagine. I mean, today, if you ask people why a company goes public, they say, so that the founders can get an exit, so that people that put money in can get exit liquidity. You know, so they can sell their stocks and make some money for their early bet. That's very different than what people would have said 100 years ago. What accounts for that difference? And does that derive from the same force that's driving some of the other things that we talked about? Or like, you know, for example, the Silicon Valley phenomenon? Yeah, great question. And again, if you don't take a historian's view, you might not think about this, but it becomes quite interesting. Railroad stocks paid dividends because they had to. Otherwise, they couldn't raise capital. Fast forward 100 years, 150 years, and the purpose of raising capital for startup technology companies is not provided by the public markets. It's provided by private markets, uh, venture capital, and so forth. So that function of providing capital to invest in a business has shifted from the public markets to private markets. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. And as you say, then now they just cash out. They don't need the capital. IPOs are not used to raise capital for further growth. They're raised, as you point out, they're used, as you pointed out, for cash out purposes. So it's a very different kind of sense. Whereas in the 19th century, companies raised money because they needed the money. And investors insisted, unless it was a busted road, 
they insisted on a cash return for their money. What you'll note, even in the tech space, the semiconductor space, those tech companies that make things still tend to pay dividends. They can be very, very small. But semiconductors pay dividends often. Service companies, software companies often do not. But those capital, and this is kind of an irony of financialization and, and the stock market, and simplify it or summarize it, it's those companies that are capital intensive are the ones that pay dividends. And those that are not capital intensive and are really in the best position to pay dividends do not. That irony is not lost on me. It's obviously lost on a lot of other investors. But yeah, the railroads could not raise more capital unless they agreed to pay preferred dividends. Building a railroad in the 19th century was tough. Building a social media company in the 21st century is tough. So investors, in order to pony up more capital to the railroads, insisted on preferred shares as an intermediate form of capital. So they would get paid before common equity. And you had companies up to and including Coca-Cola and many other kind of consumer and industrial companies having both common and preferred shares, common and preferred dividends from the get-go. And the reason was that's what investors demanded as minority shareholders of growing, rapidly growing businesses. They still wanted a, a cash return for the business. That has fallen out of favor the last couple of decades. Again, it's not illegal, not immoral, not unethical, but it's fallen out of favor. Looked at in a historical perspective, that's anomalous. And I think that investor insistence on some sort of tangible return for their investment is going to make its way back into the system. Yeah, that was going to be my next question because it is like a very fundamental irony that the companies that are capital intensive that need money are the ones that are more likely to pay a dividend. Can that be explained entirely by the happenstance of financial theories that came about and of professionalized financial industry that became accustomed to not paying dividends? In other words, is, is there anything that's that operationally explains that? Or is it just a, a coincidence that you had guys like m and who put forward the dividend irrelevance theory and there was other sort of models of the uh, financial markets that proposed this idea and it just became a kind of conventional thinking? Yeah, I think that, I don't know that I have a good answer for you other than once again, if I don't know the answer, I'm going to guess historically. And that is that companies that make things pay dividends, companies that provide services don't, and the companies that provide services came to the fore in the last 30 years when dividends were not relevant. So those semiconductor manufacturers, they were around in the 1960s, you know, those early generation tech companies, and they still caught the whiff of the, the dividend phase. It's really all the social media companies and the software companies that are relatively new that don't. So I think it's nothing in terms of their manufacturing. It's just timing that yeah. so many of these new age companies have come into being in this anomalous period, and therefore they think it's perfectly fine not to pay a dividend, even if they're very, very successful, as much of the NASDAQ now is. Whereas old line manufacturing companies didn't have that luxury because they were founded in the 40s, 50s, 60s, even 70s or 80s. And if you were the proof of your success was a dividend, now for these newest age companies, the proof of your success is just a skyrocketing share price and no cash, underlying cash stream. So I just think it's a timing issue. Hmm. So let's move. I want to move now into a more practical part of the conversation. And part of that involves really drawing distinctions between dividend investing and investing with a focus on capital appreciation. How are dividends treated differently from capital gains? Well, in academic theory, whether you're looking at Harry Markowitz in modern portfolio theory, Franco Modigliani and Merton Miller in terms of asset structure in 1958, 1961, and by implication, the CAPM people in the mid-1960s and a very important figure, James Tobin in 1958, they all pretty much have the exact same answer. And it's a very much a blackboard answer. And it's kind of the hill I'm prepared to die on. So let's get to it, Dimitri. They make the following statement, assertion, assumption, that an investor is indifferent between a harvested capital gain. I don't think the term harvested shows up in their language, but a capital gain versus a, an income payment. I draw a huge distinction because if you don't harvest it, then you can't consume it. And if you're thinking in terms of funding consumption of a actual benefit, cash benefit from some sort of investment, it's either a dividend payment or a harvested capital gain, not just a share price. But in any case, they are saying the investor is indifferent between the two forms of wealth. And that 
assumption of indifference lasts to this day in every academic treatment and practitioner treatment. And the calculation of total return from an investment very appropriately includes both. You know, how much has the asset price changed and how much income have you received in, in said measurement period? You add the two together and you get your total return. The hill I'm willing to die on is that these are not philosophically the same thing and that the implications are profound. One is a business outcome. A company makes a profit, declares a dividend, checks in the mail. That is a business outcome. A share price change, harvested gain, harvested loss, or not harvested at all, just staring at the screen, is a stock market outcome involving thousands of market participants. Now, one is a, a market outcome, one's a business outcome. Now, for really, for the last two decades, many retirees have funded consumption, or even those who are not funding consumption are just happy to see the stock market go up and to the right, which is what it normally does, and, and nothing, that's the goal without a cash payment. That is, they're happy, they're content with the market outcome, not the business outcome. The ownership dividend, the, the new book, and to some extent, a lot of my other writing, points that out and says, that's fine. Just know that those two things are not the same thing. I, as a business investor operating through the stock market, really prefer one, have no objection to the other. As a matter of fact, a rising dividend leads to higher share prices. A rising dividend leads to higher share prices, and a rising dividend leads to higher share prices. Everyone likes higher share prices. No dividend leading to higher share prices is an entirely different game altogether. Again, nothing wrong with that. But for me as a business investor, as a minority business investor, the harvested capital gain game, again, not illegal, moral, unethical, and has worked really well the last couple of decades, is profoundly different than being a business owner through the stock market. I choose to be more comfortable as a business owner through the stock market, not a speculator in share prices. Most of the industry is very, very comfortable and, and to some extent good at, because the markets do you know, appreciate over time, at just harvesting capital gains and being content with that. Again, maybe I'm a crank. I, I'll call myself a historian. Hopefully not being, uh, being a historian doesn't always mean being a crank, but simply say that these are not the same thing. And I sleep better at night with the cash basis of return, not just the prospect of a harvested capital gain or a harvested capital loss. How is someone's decision to go for a cash-based return versus an equity return from actually selling the asset influenced by his or her duration profile. That is to say, how long they plan to hold the actual underlying asset, whether they actually plan to own it for a year or 10 years or 20 years. Yeah. If there is a very reasonable argument, particularly for younger people who are not funding consumption and are not conservative, meaning they, they don't want to hold management's feet to the fire, acknowledging an agency cost of being a minority owner of, of a company. They're not bothered by any of that. From their perspective, to avoid any taxation at all, they don't want any distributions, capital gains, dividends, anything. And for them, a, a zero coupon bond of some sort or a dividend-free stock is the path of least resistance, meaning it's paperwork-free, hassle-free. And it allows them, as long as the markets continue to go up and the companies or portfolios are doing just fine, then there'll come a day sometime down the path when they do want to fund consumption and they'll have the ability to, to sell assets at that time. So there is that duration argument. Now, duration is both a technical term and the way you use it, kind of a general term. Duration in finance is a very specific kind of net present value of, of weighted cash flows. A environment in which you get cash up front has lower duration and therefore less subject to volatility. An environment in which you have all the cash flows are way down you know, 20, 30 years from now has much greater volatility subject to any changes in discount rates and so forth. But what I do think is not so much that very few practitioner investors think in terms of the stock market in terms of duration in that academic sense. I do all the time because it's my day job. But what I think a lot of people are thinking about it in the way that you just used it, which is their personal time horizon is near term, long term, somewhere in the middle. And they are making investment decisions based on what they think makes sense in terms of when they're going to need their capital. And in that environment, the current paradigm has worked really, really well. Low dividends, meaning less paperwork, and skyrocketing share prices, which has you know, worked really, really well. And as long as those very high share prices are there when you need them, 
to harvest the capital gain, or if the companies follow my guidance and start all becoming dividend payers, then it, it's going to be a happy ending for everyone. But yeah, as I've made the rounds, Dimitri, I was telling you a little bit, with some younger journalists, they are puzzled. They are absolutely puzzled. For them, they don't not only don't they see the normality of a dividend payment as a minority shareholder, they actively don't want one. There's a, a still kind of a, not called a fairy tale, but a incorrect impression going around that the tax rate on dividends and capital gains is different. It's been the same for about 20 years for long-term capital gains and long-term qualified dividends. And so the tax rate's the same. What is different is that you know, a dividend is paid regularly, generates a taxable event regularly, whereas if you don't ever sell your shares, you don't have any interaction with the tax man in regard to that. And that is appealing to a lot of people. My answer, once again, is that of a business owner. I prefer to not subordinate investment policy to tax minimization, but I've been in the industry long enough, and I'm not naive to realize that there are lots of people who delight in minimizing subordinating investment policy to tax minimization. Matter of fact, tax minimization is their only investment goal. They don't really care about the investment outcome. They just want to avoid ever paying any taxes. That reality exists. It's out there. Those people are not hardcore dividend people. They are very content with the current system. So I have a question that I feel like I know the answer to theoretically, though I wonder if the um, the historical reality differs from it. And as I go to ask the question, I I realize that it's probably one that we might not be able to answer because there weren't a lot of companies in the 1970s that didn't issue dividends. But to the extent that there were, is there some way to think about whether a company that issues dividends in a high inflationary environment performs better than one, assuming, let's say, if you're the owner of that, that your total return is better if you reinvest it every year or whatever in the actual company. We're not talking about you know, managing that cash flow separately and putting it in assets that perform better index to inflation, but just simply in terms of reinvesting that cash in the company every year, buying more of the equity. Is there any reason to imagine that that would perform better than a cashless investment where you're just expecting to exit at the end of the cycle, at the end of this period of inflation? Yeah, I haven't done that analysis. It's a really good question. Let me kind of summarize it. So let's say someone agrees partially with me and they think that the cash nexus is a good thing and holding management's feet to the fire with a dividend. That is a little bit of constraint, a little bit of Jensen agency cost management on management. So let's have the company pay a dividend and just to provide a little bit of minority control of the company versus a company that doesn't pay a dividend and management has free reign to do whatever they want. So you have two different types of investors, but the investor in the dividend-oriented company or the dividend-paying company doesn't need the cash right now. So they're just turning around and getting more shares. They're not taking the income out. They're basically providing the, the capital back to the company. Does that type of, yeah, we're going to hold your feet to the fire, but we're not actually going to take the capital. Does that work better than just letting management invest at its will? The answer is I don't know. It'd be a tough data set to figure out, but I invite the my good friends at the University of Chicago and CRISP, the best database to, uh, it sounds like a graduate student project for Doug Skinner's students, please go ahead and do that. But I don't have the answer for that. But I'm aware that that paradigm exists now because I run into investors all the time who say, I don't really need the income right now, but I like the fact that the company pays a dividend. So I'm reinvesting the dividends. And so I see that as a practical matter, but how that works out on a total return basis versus the non-dividend paying companies, I don't have an answer for that. I suspect the answer is not particularly good because non-dividend paying companies, otherwise known as speculations, have been very, very successful the mm. last 15 years. Even companies that are absolutely rock solid and are not speculations in terms of the business, but because they have no income stream, their shares are by definition, like look it up in the dictionary, definition, speculations. Even if the business is rock solid, old economy, gushing cash, you don't get any of that. You only invest and get the share price. That's the dictionary definition of a speculation. Those companies have done really, really well the last 15 years. And so I, I suspect, I don't know, but the data might be in the favor of don't even bother the company management with the burden of a dividend, even if most people reinvest it. Just let the company rip, as it were, let management rip. But this is you know, a, a philosophical choice of being a dividend investor in a stock market or being a business owner in the stock market. That has meant foregoing ownership of some very successful businesses. I sleep well at night doing that. Other 
people will not. They want to own the next big thing. I get my steady return all in cash. And growth in the cash share prices go up over time as the dividends increase. And that's a business owner in the stock market as opposed to Frankly, the last 15 years, much more successful stock market owners or stock market investors in the stock market. Question is, does that cashless paradigm go on and on and on and on? And that, that's what the book is calling into question. So the second hour of our conversation is going to be really oriented toward those who are interested in possibly adopting this model or learning more about it for their own portfolio. And in that vein, I do want to emphasize that it doesn't mean that your entire portfolio has to be invested in dividend yielding stocks. You know, just speaking personally, that's not how I invest, but there's a reason why I have some of my portfolio invested that way. And, and we can talk about that in the second hour. When you were mentioning this sort of distinction between cash list and cash based investing, it reminded me of this show that I could never really watch because I actually know so many people like this. And it was like triggering in the same way that it was kind of triggering to watch The Office and the in the early 2000s, because I actually briefly did work in corporate America, and it was awful. I hated working in corporate America. I hated having a cubicle. There was a show called, I think it was called like Silicon Valley. And I remember there was this scene, which I saw either because I saw a show or I saw a clip of it, where the the CEO of this little startup was basically making the case you don't want to be, you don't want to have a revenue or you don't want to have a profit, whatever it was. He goes, because then it's an opportunity for people to value you based on your income. You don't want that. You just want to talk in terms of like potential and just how big the total accessible market is that you can you can reach. And so I think there is something to that. And my, I imagine that some of these younger journalists that you speak to may be coming from that perspective because we have been living in this paradigm where stories, you know, when, where money is cheap or free, what really matters is who can tell the better story. And that has been the source of a lot of alpha in the markets for a long period of time. And a lot of people grew up you know, with that example. So in the second hour, Daniel, I want to talk about, I want to ask you how someone goes about investing in dividend stocks. You know, This is something that, whether it's an individual, but also I want to understand your methodology. Is it as simple as looking for the stocks with the highest dividend or is there more to that? And also, like, how does someone generate alpha as a dividend investor? Let's say this was a conference, you know, of people and like it's all the dividend investors in the world. What separates someone at the very top, someone at the very bottom? Is it buying dividend stocks that yield a high dividend that are not going to cut their dividend? Is it looking for stocks that maybe don't yield as high a dividend, but then you expect them to raise their dividend, which appreciates the stock price? I mean, I'm very curious, like mechanically, how someone like you goes about managing a portfolio. Again, you mentioned Meta. That's something I want to talk to you about. And you, you mentioned Meta. I did not mention Meta. You didn't mention Meta by name. I mentioned Meta by name. And also, there you devote an entire chapter in the book to the neoliberal order and the, the really the rise and fall of the neoliberal order, we talked about it a little bit in the first hour, something I want to get into. And I've heard you mention Gary Gerstel in other interviews. He was on the podcast. And so there's a lot of intersection there between the two of you. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want to access the second hour of today's conversation with Daniel, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and sign up to one of our three content tiers. All subscribers gain access to our premium feed, which you can use to listen to the rest of today's conversation on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. Daniel, stick around. We're going to move the rest of our conversation onto the premium feed. If you want to listen in on the rest of today's conversation, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and join our premium feed. If you want to join in on the conversation and become a member of the Hidden Forces Genius Community, you can also do that through our subscriber page. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stilianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. You can follow me on Twitter at Kofinas, and you can email me at info at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.